Welcome back. Uh, we pick up our discussion again on atomic force uh, microscopy, which we introduced or got started in our previous uh, session or class. So we have just talked about the basic features of atom atomic force microscope and introduced you to the concept of intermolecular or interatomic forces, uh, primarily the van der Waals forces, which uh, essentially is uh, responsible for imaging using an AFM. Uh, and we also talked about the predecessor to an atomic force microscope, which is the scanning tunneling microscope or as the STM as it is known. Now in this class, we will introduce you to some uh, more uh, hardware components of an AFM uh, as well as some fundamental but very important operational aspects of how they how an AFM works. And what I will take for granted is that you are now well conversant with the potential curve which we talked in the previous class which is of uh, this form. So it can be a simple 6 to 12 potential or if we are talking about two surfaces it can be the attraction can be 1 by r square and the repulsion can be little uh, shorter range. So we understand this curve, this is the separation distance or r. Uh, this is the potential or the force. Let's say this is the potential, doesn't really matter. Uh, negative uh, attraction is, we will argue that to be negative. This is repulsion. And we also understand this point. This is the point where the two surfaces come in contact. And beyond this, so up to this, so beyond this firstly there is no interaction. By the saying no interaction, we understand that there is no interaction due to the inter, uh, the molecular level or particle level or the atomic level interaction, so the van der Waals Driven's interaction. There is no interaction because uh, if we talk about a simple uh, or I think we used B and A, so let's use that to avoid confusion. For higher values of R, both the terms tends to 0 and therefore the interaction is 0. Of course, uh, let us talk, uh, we also argued in the morning that when we talk about the interaction in an actual AFM, the interaction is not between two fundamental particles or two molecules or atoms, but it's an interaction between two surfaces. So if we can convert this interaction between two particles into two surfaces by integrating it four times, which we will see in one of the subsequent lectures. Uh, what happens is the decay becomes a little more sluggish. So this r to the power minus 6 attraction gets replaced by r to the power minus 2 attraction. And similarly, the repulsion also does not remain r to the power 12. It becomes something like r to the power 8. But the overall nature remains roughly the same. There is an, uh, so for higher r, there is no interaction whatsoever then you have a significant range over which you have an attractive interaction. And then beyond this zone, you have repulsion. Okay, so we will, uh, I will assume that you understand the origin or the genesis of this particular curve and based on that we are going to discuss. So here are some of the critical components. Uh, firstly, the probes or the tips. Uh, we already have seen uh, a tip like this, which is an AFM tip, which is different from an STM tip. And this tip is often mounted to a cantilever. So you actually have two components. One is the tip itself, which is uh, very, very sharp. We are coming to the material of construction and things like that. And it is mounted to a cantilever. Now we all understand what exactly is a cantilever, so it can be a macroscopic entity also let us say a beam which is fixed at one end and free at the other end. These are all <laughs> micro or mini cantilevers, so this the overall length can be a few millimeter or even smaller than that maybe. And so you essentially have and this is sort of attached to a cantilever holder uh, which is or cantilever chip as it is called, not the holder. It's more of a chip, metallic chip, uh, which has a dimension. So you have to understand this is uh, uh, 5 to 10 
millimeter. And this is uh, this particular chip is mounted to the AFM cantilever holder. So you have to understand how small a thing we are dealing with. So this is a cantilever and uh, to one edge of the cantilever close to the very close to the edge of the cantilever the tip is mounted. Now both the cantilever as well as the tip has some desired properties and we will talk about some of them. One additional thing before I forget let me highlight that typically in commercial cantilevers the detection technique that is used is in the previous class we just uh, mentioned about the method beam bounce technique using a laser and a photo detector. We will come to each one of these elements what they do. So, in order to facilitate the use of this beam bounce technique with this laser source, typically the this area of the cantilever has a shining surface or a shining reflecting surface. Grossly the zone which is opposite uh, which is on the cantilever, but on the other side uh, of uh, other side of the cantilever to which the uh, probe or the tip is mounted. So, let me just draw it again more of an engineering drawing. So, this is the cantilever here it is mounted or attached to the cantilever chip on one side. On the other side on one side you have the probe the tip or the probe and on the other side you have a small area which prof offers a reflecting surface. Okay. So, this is what is a cantilever uh, and, and the tip we will uh, revisit it. Then the other components uh, we have a photo detector with a laser source which we have already talked here because uh, uh, most commercial AFMs use a use the so called uh, beam bounce technique for detection uh, or the detection of the level of forces or the deflection of the cantilever. Uh, we have a piezo element there can be depending on the model if we can have one or three uh, piezo elements. Uh, I, I hope you understand what is a piezo electric material. It is uh, very simply put it is a special class of material uh, across which if you apply a voltage it changes its dimension. Okay? Or in other words, if you can change the dimension of a piezoelectric material, the a voltage sort of gets generated. Here we typically use it in the first mode that is we apply a voltage which corresponds to the error voltage and based on that the piezoelectric material changes its dimension. How it works and where this uh, voltage comes we will discuss, but you may just recall that uh, in the context of uh, uh, STM we talked about the constant uh, current mode and we talked that there exists a feedback mechanism which generates a uh, difference or error voltage. A similar feedback mechanism also exists in case of an atomic force microscope and the voltage or the error voltage is fed to the piezo through this feedback uh, loop. We will uh, talk about it. So, the fourth hardware element is actually the feedback control module. So, these are the grossly the hardware control element. Uh, this particular figure if you look carefully uh, you will find uh, the existence of uh, some of these uh, let me see if I have this image somewhere no I do not have it sorry. Uh, so, some of these uh, uh, components you can already see for example, here you can see the probe or the tip that is uh, mounted here is the probe or the tip it is a little smaller image, but we will show you a bigger one do not worry. Uh, here you can see the photo detector the second element we talked about is a photo detector. So, here is the photo detector along with the laser source. So, here is the laser source you can see and I can assure you that uh, once we have this class and probably the next class you will be able to understand the exact mechanism how it works. So, do not worry about it. Well, I am just trying to give you an idea about how each one of these uh, elements are present. So, here you have the piezo or the piezoelectric uh, scanner maybe we should write the piezoelectric uh, scanner. not the piezo. So, 
So it's a piezoelectric scanner now. And here you see the feedback loop. Of course, the operation of any modern instrument is through interfacing with a computer. So you have a computer interface which runs the whole show. And that's not exactly a hardware of the AFM. That's why I have not included it. But here also, whatever little uh, thing we have discussed, you can see that this particular picture is nothing but that of a cantilever. And towards the edge, we have a tip which is mounted to it, uh, which is sort of shown in this blown up image over here. So this is uh, roughly a tip. Okay, so this is grossly the hardware elements we are talking about that a typical commercial AFM comes with. So let me just quickly repeat the probes uh, and that or the tips along with the cantilever for mounting of the tip. So here is you can see the tip and uh, so here is a tip and uh, the cantilever which is used for mounting of the tip. Uh, then you have the photo detector. So here you have the photo detector along with the laser source okay and then you have the piezoelectric scanner uh, which is here and how it works and all that we will discuss it in greater detail so here is the piezoelectric scanner and here is the feedback loop so these are grossly the four major hardware components we will discuss uh, them one by one uh, then there are certain operational aspects which i would like to highlight uh, which is not a very common thing you will find in a book but if you sort of try to work with an AFM, it's always important to understand these procedures because this gives you a very clear idea about how an AFM works. So the first one is what is known as alignment. Second one is known as the approach. Third one is more of an inbuilt thing that comes with the instrument, but you need to understand how it works is the sample stage and the raster scanning. Uh, while talking about uh, STM, we have already talked about the rastering motion that is the, the scanner sort of uh, identifies a zone. Most of the cases it, it is uh, a square zone and then it visits at every location uh, point by point. So let's say it divides it into uh, 512 by 512 number of grid points and there is an essentially a nested do loop. So uh, for j equal to 1 to 5 1 2 and then within that for i equal to 1 to 5 1 2. So the, so the scanner starts from here i equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, all the way up to 5, 1, 2, then 5, 1, 2, 2, 1, it comes back for j equal to 1, then it changes to j equal to 2, then again for i equal to 1 to 5, 1, 2, it goes all the way, then again comes back, goes like that. So essentially, this is what is known as the rastering action or the raster scan. So the scanner or the scanner tip or the probe tip in case of an AFM sort of visits at every location uh, of the sample surface, which is the region of interest one can say. to collect the information about the topography or any other detail we are uh, looking for. Uh, then finally, of course, we talk about the scanning modes, which is very, very important. And we will discuss in greater detail the operating principle of two of the modes. Uh, they are the contact mode, the simplest one, and the intermittent contact mode. which is more widely uh, known or uh, is more popular as the tapping mode. But uh, please uh, understand that tapping mode is a word you should not use scientifically because this is uh, some sort of a uh, trade name of this intermittent contact mode of a particular company. But somehow tapping mode is the word that is very, very popular. So most people working on intermittent contact mode, they will just tell you that they, are, they have done this scan in tapping mode. And you can find this word tapping mode even in journal publications and books and things like that. So no harm, you can either call it the intermittent contact mode or the tapping mode. Then you have additional uh, modes also, the non-contact mode. Uh, we will discuss and you will see that as a standalone mode, this is not really that exciting because it sort of uh, offers poor resolution and the data quality is not very good. But uh, this based on non-contact mode and by some additional uh, features, one can really generate a host of information. For example, current sensing AFM, magnetic force microscopy, all these very advanced uh, methodologies, uh, which essentially try to give you 
the different charge domains on the surface or different magnetic domains on the surface in addition to the topography, they require in the classical form the use of non-contact mode in a subtractive fashion with a contact mode scan or a tapping mode scan. Most of the cases this type of modes operate with based on the fact that uh, you do one contact mode scan and then one uh, non-contact mode scan. So that's where the utility of uh, non-contact mode also comes in. But uh, to understand the instrument, we will first understand in greater detail how the contact mode works and we will follow it up with intermittent contact or tapping mode because as you will see from our discussion, this is the preferred mode of scanning for soft materials like polymers. materials like polymers. Okay. So, let us move on to the first uh, thing we would like to discuss the probes or tips along with the cantilever for mounting of the tips. So, AFM probes or tips, tips are the most important component of an AFM as it probes or scans the surface. So, this is the, the element, the hardware element that actually goes and physically touches the surface. So, the most, so this is where the importance of the probe tip lies. This is the one that touches the surface to sense its topography. And therefore, to a large extent, the information about the surface you acquire from an AFM depends on the geometry or the condition of the probe. So, if you are using a probe which is not very sharp, it will lead to a loss of resolution because uh, you must understand that the resolution here, the feature resolution is not limited by diffraction of illumination source but is limited by the dimension of the probe. Okay. So, finer is the uh, probe geometry uh, or the sharper is the probe, better would be the resolution. Uh, since also you will all soon realize how it touches and all that, but let me just add a point. Since the probe physically touches the surface, therefore, in addition to visualizing the surface features of the topography like any ordinary, any, any other microscope, it also becomes possible to do manipulation at the surface using an AFM platform or an AFM probe because ultimately this probe is going to go and touch the surface. So, you can sort of dislodge some material using this probe, make an indent on the surface or you can deposit certain materials through this probe as it touches. So, this is like an additional advantage that uh, one can acquire or one has uh, while working with an atomic force microscope because in all other microscopes including scanning electron microscope uh, or an optical microscope, you are actually getting a virtual uh, image uh, at the focal plane, at the focus plane or the image plane uh, uh, due to illumination through light or electron uh, wave or whatever it is. But there is no mechanism by which there is anything that is physically going and touching the surface, which is uniquely unique to atomic force microscope. and one can harvest this advantage to a large extent by doing lot of manipulation or a um, uh, lot of additional things uh, at the surface using this probe. Uh, as an example, I will take up, I will give you an example of what is known as deep pen nanolithography. Towards the end of our discussion on atomic force microscope, which essentially is a nice patterning technique which uh, uses the using the AFM platform. Uh, tip diameters are typically 15 to 25 nanometer, uh, which are as I have told we have talked in the previous class itself. 
that they are roughly of the order of hundreds of molecules. Uh, resolution is a major function of the tip size and geometry. The probe determines the force. The probe also determines the force that is applied to the sample and therefore the ultimate resolution of the system. Uh, then uh, the probes are in most cases mounted to a cantilever. These cantilevered probes are highly suited to measure the topography of a sample and with different types of coatings, uh, different properties uh, like magnetic force microscopy, electrostatic property, capacitance, etc. can also be uh, measured. But there can be other types of probes which are available, for example, glass probe for example, or you can sort of uh, have a probe through which a optical fiber can be inserted to illuminate the surface. So, here is a probe and it is it's sort of a hollow probe and uh, one can sort of have an optical fiber which can be used to illuminate the surface at near field. And therefore, one can obtain a near field image of the surface. So, this that can be an optical image which uh, goes by the property of uh, NSOM which is known as the near field scanning optical microscope. So, you can illuminate the surface at the near field thereby you sort of overcome the diffraction limitation and can uh, take an optical image. But again that is possible uh, using the atomic force microscope platform. Uh, so, probes or tips typical material of construction. Uh, for contact mode, it is a silicon nitride. Uh, for tapping mode, probes are mostly made of etched silicon. The spring constant uh, is within typically within this range. Uh, spring constant essentially the cantilever here behaves as a spring. So, this is the spring constant we are talking about. Why this spring constant is important we will soon see. Uh, then uh, the natural frequency. So, the moment you have a uh, spring, uh, you, you are likely to have a resonant frequency which lies in typically in this range 50 to 400 kilohertz. Uh, how, uh, so, this uh, natural frequency or the resonant frequency, we will use the word resonant frequency. Uh, this is utilized in a large way uh, in uh, um, tapping mode or the intermittent contact mode. Okay. Uh, tip radius we have already talked, it is roughly of the order of 5 to 20 nanometers. So, we are essentially talking about this radius. So, radius is 5 to 20 nanometer and the uh, cantilever length, well I said it is a few millimeter, it is wrong. It is roughly of the order of 100 to 200 micron. The cantilever chip can be 5 to 10 millimeter which uh, is actually put onto the cantilever holder. Okay. Uh, commercial probe tip is down to 6 nanometer uh, diameter has is available, is possible. If you want to have uh, scan some very deep structures one can in principle have high aspect ratio probes. Uh, recently carbon nanotube diameter is of the order of 1 nanometer slightly higher or lower uh, based uh, tips are also available now. So, one has the cantilever and then instead of the it's silicon or silicon nitride uh, probe, it is attached to one single carbon nanotube. This also, uh, this is uh, a very recent uh, product which is coming for the last uh, 2 to 3 years I guess. And uh, since the carbon nanotube has a diameter of close to 1 nanometer or slightly less than that, this results in huge improvement in the lateral resolution, vast improvement. Yeah. 
in the lateral resolution. Uh, so this is uh, tip senses the force across the sample can deliver response to the force by deforming and uh, the next step is to track the deflection of the cantilever or the spring. So what it means we will uh, understand uh, in simple words but let us have a quick look uh, into some of the AFM probes. So this can be a tetrahedral probe you can see the height is 10 nanometer radius is less than 10 nanometer material is silicon. Uh, you can have rectangular uh, tips, you can have piezo resistive cantilever, uh, you can have triangular shaped cantilevers, you can have pyramidal tips and things like that. It might be interesting to note that the first tip used f by the inventors uh, were made by gluing diamond onto a piece of aluminum foil. This is the first uh, tips that were used and uh, it has, uh, so <coughs> tip making itself is a significant uh, business and uh, there are dedicated companies who makes these tips because you need to etch them to perfection to have the desired geometry and the sharpness and the radius of curvature. Uh, there can be some additional thing is also available which are known as the colloidal probe or colloidal tips. So instead of a on the onto the cantilever instead of a instead of a, so here is the cantilever and one typically attaches a colloidal particle to this probe. So this type of probes, uh, this has a pretty larger diameter so it can be few micron and what is interesting to note is this type of uh, probes are not, may not used for imaging because you can understand that with such a probe with a um, circular cross section the image quality will be very very blurred but this type of a uh, probe or tip is uh, very routinely used for measuring the force of uh, interaction forces between uh, two surfaces. So colloidal probes interaction force between two surfaces which is another offshoot of the AFM probe going and touching the uh, surface one can measure the force of interaction between two surfaces using an atomic force microscope. Okay. So this can be used to measure the force of adhesion between two surfaces of similar or uh, dissimilar uh, materials. Now. A good cantilever uh, has must have a few properties. So firstly the thing is that in order to measure small forces the spring constant should be as small as possible. A stiff cantilever will not respond uh, to the very small forces or deflection. The, uh, we will discuss what it means. So the spring constant should be the first criteria is that the low spring constant Second thing is the cantilever's resonant frequency should be higher than the instruments. data acquisition rate. This is extremely important that you must have the resonant frequency which must be higher than the data acquisition rate of the uh, instrument otherwise uh, there will be a mix up and you won't get the appropriate data. Uh, this is, uh, so with that uh, you can here you can see the same figure again. So this is the schematic of an AFM with the hardware elements we have talked about already, tip and probe, the piezoelectric scanner, the photo detector and the laser source and the feedback loop. This is how a commercial AFM looks like. So this is, this is all interfacing and computer. These are the controllers, uh, what you can see over here. This is uh, typically an AFM. Actually the AFM sits over here. It's as small as this one. This is actually the AFM part of it. This is an optical microscope which often is mounted 
to an AFM, a low end optical microscope with low resolution just to see that your tip has been attached properly or something like that. Uh, Before I move on to the other hardware elements or the quadrant photodiode, let me just explain to you what these three sentences mean. That the tip senses the force across the sample, the cantilever responds to this force by deforming and next step is to track the deflection of the cantilever. So what it means now, you understand that you have a probe which is a very sharp tip which is mounted to a cantilever, okay, which acts as a spring. Now, what is done in an AFM, uh, we will understand this, then this is, uh, we have already mentioned about uh, this particular technique, what goes by the name of approach, it is as follows. We will discuss approach again later, but what is done, suppose you want to scan a surface or want to investigate a surface. So first, uh, you do this, uh, the AFM tip is far away from the surface and uh, uh, so, there is no deflection in the cantilever. Okay. Now, what is done slowly before you start scanning, the surface is brought in close proximity or first brought in contact with the cantilever tip. It can be either way around, you can also have instruments in which the cantilever is progressively brought in contact with this uh, uh, surface. Now, what happens is, now I would like you to now remember this curve again. So, when these two are far, far away, you are somewhere over here. So, there is no interaction between the two surfaces. And what are the surfaces here? The surfaces here are the uh, tip of the cantilever and the surface you want to scan. Now, as you bring it closer, how you bring it closer, where to stop, we will discuss subsequently. But I am just trying to give you a glimpse of what uh, we mean by these sentences that the tip senses the force hmm? and the cantilever responds to this force. So, as you bring this, uh, let us say you are moving this surface up closer to the cantilever, what happens is when the separation distance sort of becomes smaller than this limit, huh? so whatever that limit is, let us say Rc. So, when it is adequately close and these two are smaller than Rc, what happens? Now, you are in a regime where there is an attractive interaction between these two uh, surfaces, that is this surface and this surface. So, if the tip is, if the cantilever is adequately flexible, that is the uh, spring constant is low enough to, uh, low enough to what extent? To the extent that it can sense or it deforms to these type of forces, forces in this range, right? So, then what will happen? What will happen? So, this was the first location. Now, let us say you have taken it closer to that. What will happen is because of the intersurface attraction, the cantilever will deform. So, this is the mechanism, there is an attraction now between tip and the surface and because of that, because of that attraction, the tip now, the cantilever now deforms. So, this is what is first meant by the tip senses the force across the sample. So, as you bring it closer and as the separation distance between the tip and the surface falls below this limit, now the tip sort of starts feeling the attraction of the surface. This, this attraction is purely Van der Waals interaction what we are talking about, the attractive part of Van der Waals interaction, there is no conductivity involved like what is necessary in, in an STM. Uh, there is no uh, surface charges are associated, so irrespective of whatever is the type of the surface, this attraction will always be there. What you have to understand that this separation distance is now very, very small, so you cannot do it manually because you have the risk of breaking the cantilever tip. So, these are all motorized, we will talk about it and this is what we are discussing is part of the process of approach, but once it is less than this uh, uh, critical separation distance, now there is an attraction between the tip and the surface and your cantilevers should be such 
that it deforms to these type of attraction, this level of attractions. So one has to understand that we have talked about the fact that intermolecular or in, uh, this, in, this type of interactions, uh, uh, the magnitude of the forces are of the order of 10 to the power minus 5 to 10 to the power minus 12 Newton. So these forces are very, very small. Now if you take a very stiff cantilever, let us say with a very high spring constant, what it will do? It will simply ignore this force. So there might be an attraction uh, between the tip and the surface, but if your cantilever is very, very stiff, it will not deform at all. So there might be attraction, but there will be no deformation. Okay. So this is a scenario what will happen if you have a very stiff cantilever it will not deform to the attraction or attractive forces experienced by the uh, tip due to proximity of the surface to be scanned. Therefore, it becomes extremely important to have a cantilever that has the appropriate spring constant so that it deforms to these attraction forces. Uh, next, what is important is that it deforms and what exactly it happens? Do we sort of scan at this configuration or some other configuration? That is fine. But what needs to be done, the third important thing, thing is is to quantify or measure this uh, uh, attraction, this deformation. Okay? And it is the beam bounce method is used to quantify this deformation. Okay. So, we will talk about it, but I guess this gives you an idea about uh, why the required property, there are certain specific requirements are there on the cantilever you are using and one of them is the low uh, spring constant. Uh, we will initially talk about uh, the tapping mode imaging in which uh, the resonant frequency does not really come into play. Uh, what is the exact role of the resonant frequency? Because if you remember carefully, there was also a limit or a condition set on the resonant frequency, uh, which is specific to the tapping mode. The spring constant, now you, I, under, I hope you understand why you need to have a cantilever with a low spring constant in this particular range. Of course, you understand already why you need to have a very small tip radius, because to a large extent, the resolution of your final image is a function of your uh, tip radius. Okay. Uh, next, so the if we look at the hardware elements we had talked about, firstly we had talked about the probes or the tips. The second one is the photo detector. Laser source. The third one is the piezoelectric scanner. And the fourth one is the feedback module.
uh, feedback module is more of a controller and it's more of the classical feedback mechanism. So there's nothing much to discuss. But this photo detector, uh, along with the laser source, this is important and it requires for your attention to understand. And once we are through with this uh, 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 hardware elements, we will then focus our attention on to some of the operational aspect. Uh, we start off with alignment and then approach. And then uh, raster scan and uh, data generation. So after this class and probably the subsequent class, you will be able to understand these individual elements and these individual operations as well as how exactly an AFM generates an image. So let's see what is a photodiode. So what we will be using is essentially a quadrant photodiode, QPD. It's also often referred to as the split photodiode. or the PSD, position sensitive diode. And uh, well, uh, What exactly is a photodiode? So when a reverse bias p-n junction diode is illuminated with light, the reverse diode current varies linearly with the light flux, such as a p such a p-n junction diode is called a photodiode. Or in other words, in very simple terms, if you put, uh, if you uh, focus light on a photodiode, uh, a voltage gets generated. And a position sensitive diode or a quadrant photodiode, what happens is the magnitude of the voltage is a function of the location where the light or the laser spot is shining. So the easiest way to understand from the standpoint of uh, an AFM is uh, to understand it uh, from the point of a graph paper. So let's say this is a photodiode. Uh, this may look uh, gigantic, but reality is for an AFM, this is very, very small. The diameter is let's say few millimeter, five or six millimeter, and this is the center. So if a laser or a light spot falls at the center, it will generate zero volt. Typically, in most commercial AFMs, if the light spot falls exactly at the periphery, it sort of corresponds to a voltage of roughly 10 millivolt. Okay. It, it can vary, really does not matter. Now, if this uh, spot, which can be a laser spot or a light spot, falls at any other location, it generates a finite uh, voltage. it generates a finite voltage. Uh, what you can find out from this QPD with, with the help of proper computer interfacing is the precise location. So uh, since we call it a QPD or quadrant photodiode, so one can split this location into let's say the X component and Y component. So here for example, you can let's say that this total magnitude corresponds to let's say 3 millivolt. But you can also find out uh, what are the locations, individual locations or individual components of X and Y over here from the QPD. Really does not matter, you do not have to uh, understand it in greater uh, detail, but uh, what you need to understand is how this light source comes and uh, how this is useful in uh, generating the, uh, the scans. So in other words, what you can understand that the center corresponds to 0 millivolt. 
So let's say a circle, a hypothetical or imaginary circle passing through this point around the concentric with the center. At all locations, the current will, the voltage will correspond to 3 millivolt. But you can individually find out what is the x and y component and which will be different from this point and let's say uh, this point. So, if somebody is interested, you are encouraged to find out more details, but this much is good enough for our understanding. So, the uh, first what now we will do, uh, we will come back to the piezoelectric scanner after a while. So, uh, with the knowledge that uh, it is it's a scanner uh, mounted, uh, a scanner uh, is mounted to a piezoelectric material and uh, we have already talked that a piezoelectric material is a material to which if you apply a voltage it changes in dimension. Now, depending on whether the voltage bias you are applying that is a positive or negative, the change in the dimension will also accordingly vary. So, suppose if you have a piezo to which if you give a positive voltage, it might actually elongate. So, it might become short and uh, it might become thin and tall. In contrast, if you give now a negative bias or negative voltage to the same piezo, it will shorten. So, it will become short and thick. So, this is the only thing probably you, you need to understand, but maybe we will uh, have some better idea about this piezo. With this much amount of understanding about the hardware, so we now understand the existence of the probe tips along with the cantilever. We understand the existence of the photodiode, uh, the quadrant photodiode or the position sensitive diode. And uh, maybe uh, in very simple terms, what we also need to understand that we have a scanner. which is let us say a piezo. And in simplest terms, let us understand that the cantilever is mounted to the bottom of the scanner. Okay. So, now if you apply a voltage to this uh, piezoelectric scanner and it changes dimension, accordingly the cantilever surface will also come up, come down or go up depending on the uh, location of this uh, piezoelectric scanner or the dimension of the piezoelectric scanner. We will revisit it again. So, maybe it uh, is a good idea to have a look at this particular, uh, we will see all this photograph. This gives you some bit of idea now and I guess uh, it makes some sense to you right now uh, about uh, the AFM. So, here is the laser source. We have talked about the photo detector. Here we have drawn a square or rectangular photo detector which is perfectly fine, but it can be a circular detector as well. Uh, the key principle remains the same. If the laser light is falling on the at the center, it is 0 volt and further away you go from the center, there is a finite uh, voltage gets generated. You have a feedback loop which is shown uh, schematically. You have the scanner over here to which is uh, it is mounted to the piezoelectric material. You can identify now the sharp tip or the probe, you can identify the cantilever and uh, you can identify this zone also what we talked as the, sh as the shining uh, reflective zone on the cantilever which is right opposite to the uh, location of the tip. Now, uh, we will come to the concept of what is known as alignment. Okay. So, essential idea is you have a laser source from which the laser light is coming out. You mount your cantilever somewhere. So, he, you have your cantilever okay. and you, this is the reflecting surface. So, this is the cantilever chip which is mounted to the cantilever holder which is attached to the in instrument. The first step of your alignment and you also have your QPD, but initially you need to understand that the laser light goes in a completely different direction and does not come and fall on the QPD. So, there is no reading on the QPD. Okay. Your objective for alignment first is to bring the cantilever or the tip into the path of 
of the laser. How would that help? So you essentially have can have two different screws. for uh, giving motion in x and y direction. So, what you have to do? You have to turn them in such a fashion so that the tip now moves in the desired direction and it comes now into the path of the laser light. So, the moment this is the way where the laser light was going. The moment the cantilever now comes in the path of the laser source, if you remember correctly, it has a shining area. So, the laser now falls on this shining area which now acts as a mirror and gets reflected. So, the moment it gets reflected, it is now traveling in this direction. It is no longer traveling in this direction. Okay? It is no longer going in this direction, but the laser gets reflected here. So, this is the first stage of alignment or the first step of alignment. And then the second step of alignment, again you have two sets of screws. Uh, which is attached to the uh, to the mounting which holds the uh, piezoelectric uh, which holds the PSD or the photodiode. So you turn these photodiodes, etc., etc. Whatever you want to do, you move the diode a little bit so that uh, what happens is that the diode now is positioned in such a way that the laser light falls exactly at the center. So this is the final configuration after alignment. So, you have the laser light coming in, you have the tip on the path of the laser light, the light comes and falls on the reflective area and it gets reflected in such a fashion that it falls exactly at the uh, center of the QPD or the quadrant photodiode. So, as we have already told that uh, if the laser spot or the light falls at the center of the QPD, then voltage equal to 0. So, this is now what you can say is a perfectly aligned uh, AFM. But still what you need to un uh, understand is that even in this aligned AFM, actually the tip is still far away from the surface to be scanned. Okay. But you can have a configuration like this, where this is your laser source and your cantilever is now in its path, it reflects away and it goes and hits, uh, goes straight to the center of the QPD. So, this is a perfectly aligned cantilever and now if you look at this particular image, I guess you now can identify that well, this actually shows that it is a perfectly aligned cantilever. Forget about the scanner and the sample part of it, but you see the laser, uh, the uh, cantilever is in its path where it gets reflected and is falling on the center of the photo detector. So, this is a perfectly aligned cantilever now. So, uh, the way we are approaching, so we now feel that we understand uh, what the AFM probes or tips and the cantilevers are. We also understand the functionality about the photo detector along with the laser source. So, we understand what exactly the laser is doing. Uh, we understand very briefly, but functionally what the quadrant photodiode is supposed to do. And we have also uh, discussed the process of alignment. Uh, the next class we start discussing from the uh, process of approach and then how the raster scanning is done to generate an atomic force microscope image or data. Uh, thank you.